death of a parent is something that no one is ever prepared for emotionally. This note was the last exchange between a dying man and his son. It was also a son's last hope to find the mother he'd been taken from as a little boy, and a father's last chance to grant his son's greatest wish, a wish that could heal a whole family. In 1968, George Thomas's father became ill quite suddenly. He went in, and it was cancer. The cancer then it spread down into his neck and his upper chest. Dad, I need to ask you something. It's important. Dad couldn't talk. His jawbone was gone. I wrote on a piece of paper, where the hell is she? I didn't say who. And he, he wrote back, I'll never tell you. Why can't you do this for me? He died two days later. And uh, when my father died, everything died with him. The, the secret, uh, he took the secret to, to his grave. George Thomas was born in 1937. His childhood is now mostly a blank for him. Most of it I can't remember because I think that something happened that to this day, I'm afraid to remember what happened. He does know that he had a mother who loved him, and he dearly loved her. My mom was short, had real nice long blonde hair, and uh, she'd take me to school once in a while and bring me back home. One day in the early 40s, when he was five or six years old, George's life changed forever. The teacher called me to come up the front, and my dad was standing up there by the door. And then he took me, and we went out the hallway, and I just thought he was taking me home. And uh, I never saw my mother again. He, uh, he took me away. On that day, George's father took the boy out of school, out of town, and out of his mother's life. No one will ever know why. From then on, George stayed with his father. He doesn't remember hearing from his mother again, with one exception. Two guys came to the door, and uh, my dad hid me under the bed. And he said, stay under there. Don't move. I really wanted to come out, but when my dad told you to do something, you did it. We're investigating the disappearance of your son on behalf of your wife. You wouldn't happen to know. And they said that they was uh, looking for me, that my mother had sent them to get me back. No, I wish I did last. Well, I tell you, I can remember laying under that bed and my knees were shaking so bad, I don't know how they didn't hear it. But uh, I was scared. Can't help us, sir? No, I'm afraid not. I'm a little busy. I'm sorry. Very well. My father told him that he didn't know where I was or, or anything, that someone must have kidnapped me. And, uh, well, he made him leave. Come on out of there. Dad got me out from under the bed, and he said, get your suitcase, and we've got to pack, and we've got to leave. Who is that? And uh, we packed our stuff, and we left right away, practically but within an hour or two. I had asked him many times, where's Mom? When, when can we go home? And that's when he told me, well, she don't want you. She's no good. She's a drunk. George's dad frequently sent him off to friends in other towns. But the friends of his father were only strangers to a frightened and lonely child. My dad, he would take me to the bus station and put me on a bus, tell the bus driver to keep an eye on me. And uh, I was just put from family to family. You do what he tells you to, all right? He kept me away from people. He hid me in places. But to me, it was a way of life after a while. I didn't know anything else. As the years passed, George's father never told the boy anything about his mother. George had no idea where she was living, or if she was alive, or even what her name was now. But he kept asking. I would, you know, I said, why don't you let me go back? And, and he said, you're never going back to your mother. She don't want you. He always, that's all he ever told me was that she didn't want me. By 1950, the Thomases were boarders at a farmhouse in Nebraska. But George's father decided to move on yet again with his son and fifth wife in tow. We just about starved to death that time. 
Matter of fact, if they hadn't had hot meals in the school, I would have went hungry. One day he come and he says, well, he said, we're going broke. Got we're moving. Break. And I said, Dad, I'm not going with you. I'm not packing my suitcase anymore. I'm going to stay here. I'd had it. I was mad. Yeah. I didn't want no more of it. It was the most biggest decision of my life. Get in the car. Dad, I'm sick of moving around with you. He didn't say much. He just stood there and stared at me like, like uh, I can't believe you're, you're telling me no. They got in and they went. And believe me, I had a sinking feeling in my stomach. Because I figured they'd come back, but they, he never came back to get me. George worked as a farmhand until, at 15, he joined the Navy. When he was discharged in 1959, he moved on with his life. But he was always haunted by vague memories of his childhood and the mother he hadn't seen since he was six. While I was in the Navy, I would write to Dad. I asked him, how about tell me where my mother said And he, he sent me a letter back. He says, I told you she's dead. And I wrote back and I said, you're lying, I don't believe you. Deep down, I never did, never did believe him. Dad deprived me of, of my childhood, of my boyhood. I, I didn't even have a damn life because of him. When George's father finally died in 1968, he took his secret with him. George gave up all hope of ever finding his mother. When we continue. I didn't think I had a chance of finding her because of the amount of years involved. She may have remarried. She might even be deceased. When George Thomas was only five or six years old, his father took him away from his mother. He never saw her again, though he missed her every day of his life. He'd given up trying to find her because he didn't even know what name she was living under. And his father refused, to his deathbed and beyond, to tell his son anything about her. By 1986, George was married to his second wife, Anne Marie, and living in Omaha, Nebraska. He had children of his own, including 24-year-old Cindy Thomas. Cindy, got them? Yes, I got them. Here they are. Our teacher asked us to do a family tree, and I started off with mom's side, the names of everybody on that side, and it was really easy. Then when I got to dad's side, there just really wasn't anybody there. You know, I knew my grandpa's name, of course, because I remembered him. But Cindy's grandmother's name had been a secret hidden for more than 40 years. George couldn't help hoping they'd find it. I called the branch of military my grandfather was in and asked them to look up the Navy records for me. And I pretty much went straight from getting them to my dad's house because I knew he was excited about getting them. That's your mother's name. Yeah, Fall River, Massachusetts. Under his mother's married name, Thomas, the Navy records provided a more than 40-year-old address in Fall River, Massachusetts. Once we read through the records, the first thing we did was write for my birth certificate. And when it came back, my mother's name on there was Helen Ann Raymond. Now they had two names to work with, a married name, Helen Thomas, and a maiden name, Helen Raymond. We should find something. It was kind of exciting because it just was a big thing for us. And we walked through rows of phone books and we photocopied the Paul River, Massachusetts phone book pages of all the Raymonds and of all the Thomases just in case she would have kept her married name and then brought those pages home. And Dad and Ann made up a master letter and sent letters asking for information about a Helen Raymond. They sent dozens of letters to people who had the same last names. We said that they could call us, collect. We gave our phone number, our address. Any information they could give us about her or of her would be appreciated. There's times when he would get discouraged and say, oh, maybe what my dad said is true. She didn't want me. One of their letters happened to reach a man named Dan Raymond. In the letter, he was asking if I knew his mother or her whereabouts and that he hadn't seen her in 45 years. 
And if there was anything I could do to help him. I know what it's like not to have any parents because I lost my father when I was 11 years old and I lost my mother at 18 when I was in Vietnam. And I said, well, I'll see what I can do for the man. Dan began searching for the mother of a man he'd never met at the Registry of Motor Vehicles where he was a police officer. I didn't think I had a chance of finding her because of the amount of years involved because I figured that this woman had to have moved. She may have remarried. She might even be deceased. But I figured the only way I could find it was go through the system and see if she had a driver's license or car registered. Because at least if I had that, I had some place to start. I tried to see if I could find a Helen Raymond on our computers. I came up empty there. So at this point is when I had to call George. People nowadays usually won't even give you the time of day. And, uh... To me, it, it, was, it was really something because nobody ever had tried to help me before. And uh, whenever anybody did, it seemed that sometimes that uh, I didn't know how to take it. It was great that someone cared enough to help. George's clouded recollections of his mother and childhood gave Dan Raymond little information to go on. George remembered that there was a bakery in the neighborhood, but he wasn't sure the, the name of the bakery. Dan tracked down a bakery in the area. He stopped in, hoping the owners could remember anything from 40 years earlier that might help him locate George's mother. He said the name wasn't familiar to him either, but that his sister might be able to help because she knew everybody in the area and that she would be there like on a Thursday. So I returned to the bakery a few days later and, and spoke with the sister. Yes, sir. May I help you? I am Dan Raymond. I was here the other day. Ah, oh, yes. Mike told me about you. I'm trying to find a woman by the name of Helen Thomas. Can you help me with that? Helen Thomas. I brought up the name no. Helen Thomas, and she said she really no, didn't know the name, so then I used Helen Raymond. Oh. Uh, and she said, well, I don't know a Helen Raymond, but I knew a Helen Rasmus. And that they used to call her oh. Helen Raymond. And I said to myself, great, here we go. Now we got three names I got to worry about. I can't find these two, and now there's a third name involved. Joke comes in every Sunday morning like right. clockwork. She told me that there was a man that came into the bakery every Sunday morning between 6.30 and 7.15 in the morning, that I should go and see him, that he may be able to help me. All right, I'll see you on Sunday. Right. Okay, good you. luck. Thank you, bye. But a late-night investigation made it impossible for Dan to get to the bakery that early on Sunday. And it was approximately 10 o'clock in the morning, my phone rings, and this gentleman came on the phone and said, are you the inspector that is looking for a Helen Raymond? Okay. He said, well, you can find her at this address, and then hung up on me. Hello? Hello? And I said, you know, this is the best break I've had through the whole thing, and I gotta go. So that was it. I got in my car, and I drove to the address. The tip led Dan to an apartment building less than a block from the bakery. When I get to the house, I look at the mailboxes. There was no Thomas, no Raymond, no Rasmus, and I felt... Okay, here we go. Somebody gave me a hoax phone call. The manager said that he didn't recognize any of the names, but there was a woman in her late 70s living on the second floor. Going up the stairs, I was kind of like, uh-oh, this is not going to work because nobody knows the lady. The name's not outside, and I, I really thought it was a hoax phone call. Hi, I'm Dan Raymond with the Registry of Motor Vehicles. Was your name Helen Thomas? It used to be. You have a son named George? She looked at the picture, <laughs> and she said, yes, he's my son. Yes. And she kind of looked at me you with this, I don't know what you want to call it, like somebody was playing a joke on her. Thank you. And at that point, it was like, wow, found her. It's right here. Is it Dan Raymond? The phone rang. And Hello? Dan? It was Dan Raymond. Listen, I have a surprise for you. And he said, uh, Yeah, hold on. There's, uh, there's someone here that wants to talk to you. And I knew who it was. It 
very minute he said it, it was my mother. Mom, is, is that you? The, the minute she spoke, I knew who she mom? was. For, 45 years, and, and it was yes, like mom. yesterday. It was a miracle. They were finally reunited after all those years. And when he burst out in tears, it was the most wonderful feeling. This was it. We finally found her. Yes, I love you, Mom. I was so surprised. I really was. So excited that I started shaking a little bit. <laughs> but I was glad. Oh, it made me happy. I, my prayers have been answered. The reunion took place six weeks later, postponed only by the birth of George and Anne Marie's daughter, Helen, named for his mother. Oh, I was a little shaky, you know. Had butterflies in my stomach. I didn't know what to do. We went down the ramp and, and all these people was there and I picked my mother right out of the crowd and I hugged her. I was hugging her like crazy, and I said, well, and I hugged her even closer. I said, uh, well, look at our noses, you know, and we both have big noses, and, and uh, we're both short, and <laughs> how could I not know her, you know? <laughs> it was fun seeing my grandmother and my dad together at the same time because they were both so excited. My grandma came running up to us, and was she was hugging everybody in sight. It was just a real exciting day. I think the hero in the story would be Dan Raymond because he was a stranger without knowing anybody took all, so much of his time to go out and help someone else find their mom. When I first saw them hug, it was like I was just smiling from ear to ear. And uh, it just gave me a real good feeling inside. It gave me the feeling like now it's over and now I can sit back and enjoy this. My dad seems happier. He has someone to talk about now. You can say, my mom said this or did that. When I see my mother today, I, I just feel warmth and comfort. Just the love for her. Just want to grab her and start hugging her all over again like the first time, you know. And my life is complete. It's complete. If I have any advice to give to people, if you're looking for a brother or sister or someone in the family don't give up because there's lots of miracles out there and someday you're gonna find the person you're looking for i love you